Good evening, everybody. I just want to check that everybody can see me. Yes, that's good. Well, what a what, what a relief. Hi, everyone. So I'm Johnny Walker, uh, associate professor at in Northumbria Uni at, in in Newcastle, and I just want to say, firstly, uh, thanks to Craig and, and Chris for for having me chair this session. Um, it's an honour to be a part of Fear 2000 in in any way, and um, it's especially um, significant for me this one because Tom. Um, as some people know, is a very, very good friend of mine, and we uh, we go back a long way to undergraduate days. So it's a it's a real honour for me to be able to to be able to do this. What we're going to do um, is Tom is going to talk for about forty minutes, um, and then after that, we will be taking questions. Uh, just, just, just as a reminder, as, as Craig said, if you can just uh, type the questions into the chat function. Um, and I will sift through them at the end and give you the opportunity to to ask it yourself, or of course I am happy to do the uh, to do the asking on your behalf. Right, so I'm going to introduce Tom now, so we can get this so we can get this party started properly. So Thomas Joseph Watson is a lecturer in transmedia production at Teesside University. His current research considers representations of violence, transgression, and extremity fringe music subcultures and their cinematic representation and cultures of noise music. He's the co-editor of the forthcoming volume, Refocus, the films of Nicholas Winding Refn from Edinburgh University Press next year. And his most recent publication is the book chapter, The Kids Are Alt-Right, Hardcore Punk, Subcultural Violence and Contemporary American Politics in Green Room, which appears in the fantastic edit of the collection, New Blood, Critical Approaches to Contemporary Horror. And the title of his presentation this evening is, This is Not Just a Minor Threat, Music Subcultures and Contemporary Horror Cinema. So everybody applaud, virtually or otherwise, Thomas Joseph Watson. Hello, Tom. Hello, can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear you, that's fine, mate. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna share gonna... my screen. I'm going to disappear now. <laughs> okay. Can everyone see my slides okay? Yep. Mate, okay. Um, hello, everybody. Um, I'm just going to stick to the scripts because if I don't, I'm going to go off on tangents and we'll be here for hours. Um, and I don't think anyone necessarily wants that on a Friday evening. Um, so we'll start as I mean to go on. I've got my iPad next to me with my kind of my, my, my paper. So if my eyes are diverting away, that's what I'm doing. I'm, I'm not being distracted by any cute dogs running around, as is usually the case with Zoom meetings like this. Uh, I already said I was going to stick to the script. I'm already wavering off it. So I'm just going to revert back to, to my paper. So like Johnny said, um, this paper is entitled, uh, This is Not Just a Minor Threat, Music Subcultures and Contemporary Horror Cinema. So in opening remarks to the, to the 2021 FIA 2000 Horror Unbound online conference, there was mention of unforeseen forces perhaps working against us, a confluence of horror tropes and scenarios converging, and that there was always some sort of comfort in being located in the bunker-like void cinema at Sheffield Hallam University, with a like-minded community that would no doubt be best placed to survive such an onslaught. Such unforeseen circumstances or unseen forces, if you like, were seemingly conspiring against myself during the conference. And the reason why my keynote was rescheduled to this particular evening was due to an unfortunate occurrence of norovirus, of which I will not get into the gory details. Needless to say, on the week of the conference, I was feeling like, and not looking too dissimilar to this gentleman. Um, the titular Uncle Peckerhead from the punk horror film of the same name. Although I am not a demonic undead roadie charged with killing poses whilst protecting a struggling DIY punk band, I did in fact resemble an undead punk. I suppose these circumstances are quite fitting for a talk that aims to interrogate the intersections between selected examples of contemporary horror cinema and subcultures of punk, offering a good starting point to initiate this discussion. I would also just like to take this opportunity to thank Craig and Chris for inviting me to speak at the, last month, at the conference last month and to Craig in particular for programming one of the FIA 2000 panels I am most proud of presenting on, Make America Hate Again, where I was first able to talk about my very early and ongoing research in the punk subcultures and horror cinema. I would also like to thank everyone here for giving up part of their Friday evening to indulge me and hear me talk about my key interests. Okay, so as described in my keynote abstract, the intersections between horror media and punk music subcultures have a long-standing cultural history 
ranging from the B-movie-inspired punk aesthetics of bands such as The Misfits, The Necros, and Negative Approach, onwards to more contemporary examples of hardcore music represented by bands such as Voorhees and Send More Paramedics, both of these bands recently celebrating notable anniversary releases and reunion shows. In these examples, long-established horror film iconography has been appropriated across a variety of album sleeves and related merchandise, and has been integrated heavily into aspects of performance and promotion. The lead singer of Send More Paramedics, B. Hellmouth, remaining in character throughout interviews and often lumbering through the crowds gathered at hardcore shows, much to the chagrin of the uninitiated and to the amusement of myself and Johnny, my keynote chair, when we seen them probably circa 2008 in Newcastle upon Tyne. Additionally, alongside song titles and album work, Examples of promotional music videos from particular artists maintain explicit connections to canonical horror cinema. In this respect, we need look no further than the late 1990s incarnation of the popular horror band, uh, sorry, hardcore horror band, The Misfits, a group by this point experimenting with more commercial metal influences and attaining mainstream airtime and wider visibility as a result. Indeed, with the release of the band's famous Monsters LP in late 1999, it was the George A. Romero directed music video for the album Soul single Scream, alongside the band's reciprocal appearance in the late director's film Bruiser in 2000, that marked a consolidation between both horror media and punk music crossover. Although these examples are quite broad and range across cultural and temporal spaces, it is perhaps clear to see how certain examples of punk music have adopted and reappropriated the iconography and themes of horror cinema and specific subgenres as well, into their respective releases and ephemera, setting a visible precedent for such a relationship. What is missing from such a discussion, however, is a sustained examination of the ways in which horror cinema has been able to incorporate elements of punk and subcultural value into narratives that explicitly address representations of the subculture. Taking the observations of Roger Sabin as its starting point, depicted on the screen at the moment, in that punk was not an isolated bounded phenomenon, but had an extensive impact on a variety of cultural and political fields. This talk aims to chart the historical and cultural developments of contemporary punk horror cinema, and would be remiss to ignore the apparent relationship and lineage between these examples and the so-called punk exploitation film. In these contexts, punk exploitation is used as a historical and cultural foundation that encompasses the related discourses of exploitation cinema and cult film. A small caveat is perhaps needed here in that for reasons of time restrictions and space, this talk is primarily concerned with iterations of 21st century North American punk horror cinema, and therefore relates predominantly to North American iterations of punk subcultures, specifically those of American hardcore and its subcultural offshoots. A wider exploration of these themes and ideas alongside an examination of cross-cultural and transnational influences would no doubt encompass a wider range of films. For example, the biker punk films of Gariku Eishi, Crazy Thunder Road from 1980 and Burst City from 1982 act as foundational cinematic representations of 1980s Japanese punk subcultures in the context of exploitation cinema, with clear reference points to Mad Max and its sequel, The Road Warrior. This talk therefore acts as a snapshot of a larger research project examining the cultural history of punk exploitation. As a subgenre of exploitation cinema, the descriptor of punk exploitation has been referred to in critical interrogations of transgressive anti-art cinema, examples being They Eat Scum by Nick Zed from 1979, alongside documented examples of key subcultural scenes and their dramatizations, examples of which might be The Decline of Western Civilization and Suburbia, by Penelope Spheris from 1981 and 1983 respectively, in addition to notable examples of genre films with respective cult reputations. Examples which you're probably familiar with would be Class of 1984, Ladies and Gentlemen, The Fabulous Stains, and Repo Man alongside The Return of the Living Dead from the late to mid 1980s. Adding to this tentative canon would be the documentary work of Todd Phillips, an example being hated G.G. Allen and the Murder Junkies from the early 1990s, and the more recent Rodney Asher film, The El Duce Tapes, films that document the turbulent lifestyles and transgressive behaviours and performances of some of the more contentious figures loosely associated with punk. 
I did intend to show some clips from these films, but the imagery of Gigi Allen defecating into his hands before flinging fecal matter into a being crowd and performing self fellatio is perhaps too much for a Friday evening. I and mean, of course, if you want to, we can maybe discuss that at some other point. However, there is a through line here. The earliest film in this discursive grouping is They Eat Scrum from 1979, a film made by the exponent of the cinema of transgression, Nick Zed. It is through such a film that we can see a clear lineage to the youth exploitation films made in the 1950s and 60s, at least through the intentions and politics of its director. As Zed suggests, reflecting on his earlier work, I was aware of the fact that there were these exploitation films made about juvenile delinquency back in the 50s and 60s. I guess it was because the media at the time liked to exaggerate and distort the dangers of youth culture, and I felt like a similar situation was happening with punk in 77. I thought that I would like to make a low-budget comedy shot in Super 8 that were exaggerating the demonization of punk rockets, and that's when I wrote the screenplay for this feature film called They Eat Scum. Zed saw his work in terms of countercultural shock, as a name like the cinema of transgression would suggest, and an apparent shift from a perceived complacency of the 1960s is something felt to be remedied by the emergence and consolidation of first wave punk in the 1970s. What becomes apparent here is a reaction to the moral panic that followed in the wake of punk, something that has continued to arise through its successive iterations. As Zed continues, shock value was an important element with punk, which I think was based on the complacency of the rock culture at the time, which was controlled by the 60s generation who were the people in power controlling the media and the record industry. And they'd made the decision that the counterculture had ended with Woodstock. In reality, there was a genuine counterculture, punk, that was a reaction to all those dinosaur bands that were getting all the airtime. I really like these low budget, quickie juvenile delinquency exploitation movies like Riot on Sunset Strip. And I wondered why nobody had made a movie satirizing the dominant culture's opinion of punk rock. Now, the comments made by Zed here um, are contained and can be found within the indispensable coffee table volume, Destroy All Movies, The Complete Guide to Punk on Films, uh, published in 2010. So slightly before the time period that I'm going to be focusing on um, in the main case studies for this particular talk. And as the title would suggest, this book represents one of the most comprehensive overviews of punk subcultures up to that point in time, as they have appeared across several decades of cinema and television. In his opening forward to the book, Richard Hell, um, pictured on the slide, member of television, The Heartbreakers and The Voidoids, um, asserted the following. I learned from this book that punk, quote unquote, um, and its signs, its language, its clothes, its haircuts, its music, tends to stand for two things in the culture. First, it stands for the possibility of pride and haven for kids who are rejected as worthless by almost everyone else. Penelope Spheris' Suburbia is probably the strongest illustration of this. And Penelope Spheris is going to be a figure that I mention quite often, I think, in this uh, talk this evening. The other thing punk stands for is an unhinged, violent, criminal threat to all of society and every decent person. Mark Lester's Class of 1984 exemplifies that. Most of the movies in this book incoherently mix these two messages. And it's that idea of incoherent mixing that I kind of want to move away from when we address the more recent films in punk exploitation. So in reference to these two canonical films when referring to punk exploitation and punk cinema more broadly, Hell is able to determine the contradictions inherent in the representation of punk as a subculture. As Hell continues, these films represent two messy sides of the same coin. And as much as their protagonists and antagonists get pride and self-respect by exposing society's hypocrisy and underlying ugliness, which makes them dangerous. What the relationship between these films suggests is a cyclical process whereby society rejects that which it is threatened by, and such rejection results in ruptures of threatening behavior and extreme violence. In the comments made here, Richard Hell and Nick Zed touch upon the moral panics surrounding punk and the way these prevailing attitudes often resulted in exploitative representations of the subculture in cinema. Writing in the zine Maximum Rock and Roll, Jeff Walker offers a wider critical assessment of 1980s punk exploitation cinema, identified as punk exploitation, and asserts the following when examining King films from the genre. Hysteria over punk's influence on kids 
became a cottage industry for the 80s media, launching countless TV episodes, talk show panels, and sensationalist news articles. Penelope Spheris made punk violence the center of thesis for her seminal 1981 documentary, The Decline of Western Civilization. Of course, American punk of the 1980s really did have a violent streak, and Hollywood had perhaps the worst case of all. The truly detrimental effect of punk exploitation was that such one-dimensional representations became self-fulfilling prophecies, drawing more violent elements to punk. Punks became the go-to menacing switchblade-wielding other when the hero had a close call in a dark alley or empty subway car. Violent punks were a convenient plot device for lazy screenwriters. So in recent years, the term punk exploitation has been applied to several examples of independent horror cinema, with Green Room by Jeremy Saulnier, The Ranger, Straight Edge Kegger by Jason Zink, and Uncle Peckerhead being notable examples of what this keynote defines as punk horror. Released over a period of five years, these films represent punks as both victims and antagonists, and go on to provide notable ways in which key historical subcultural moments and scenes can be deconstructed and critiqued alongside their wider representation in the media. Indeed, films such as The Ranger are imbued with further subcultural capital and punk authenticity through the involvement of notable punk adjacent musicians, such as Wade McNeil of Alexis on Fire, Black Lungs and Gallows fame, as well as being continuously framed as punk related horror. For example, The Ranger has been discussed as a punked out cabin in the woods. So you kind of get the idea of what the film entails maybe before you actually even go to see it. This talk aims to explore the ways in which examples of punk horror can observe and incorporate the changing subcultural values, sensibilities, and politics of punk into their narratives and wider production contexts, perhaps marking a shift away from accusations of lazy screenwriting, base stereotyping, and the often cross representation or misrepresentation of the subculture. So in this chapter, Silver Screen Sedition, Authorship and Exploitation in the History of Punk Cinema, Bill Osgoby talks about the way punk filmmakers, screenwriters and creatives from within specific scenes go on to communicate their own subjective experiences of punk through the various projects they are involved with, ruminating on subcultural values, performance, politics and notions of authenticity. As I have discussed elsewhere in regards to Green Room from 2015, this particular film acts as a semi-autobiographical reflection of director Jeremy Solnier's own experiences as part of the Washington DC punk and hardcore scenes of the late 1980s and early 1990s, a history which is inflected with the dominant political discourse that characterized the Reagan administration and resulted in a growing sense of disenfranchisement and politicization within an increasingly fractured scene. This is a useful starting point, as all of the films identified here as punk horror cinema all seem to deal with notions of authenticity and subcultural capital in their own distinctive ways. So my previous work drew upon the ideas of Pierre Bourdieu and Sarah Thornton when referring to punk representation and subcultural capital, a point I would like to reiterate here in relation to Green Room. So Thornton's conception of subcultural capital in particular are evidenced at several key points in the film working to establish subcultural boundaries and the position of the characters within them. The first clear instance of Thornton's objectified subcultural capital relates to the ways members of the fictional band The Ain't Rights treat Tad, a local Oregon punk and gig promoter who they are staying with on their tour. This is before the onslaught of violence at the hands of the film's skinhead antagonists. As Thornton notes, quote, subcultural capital confers status on its owner in the eyes of the relevant beholder and is objectified in the form of fashionable haircuts and well-assembled record collections. As lead singer of the Ain't Rights Tiger approvingly browses Tad's impressive record collection, he remarks how this dude's legit, a point that is immediately derided by the band's drummer Reese, remarking what? Because he wakes up at five in the morning to put jizz in his hair. Um, the critique offered by Reese relates to the ways in which both cultural and subcultural capital put a premium on the second nature of their knowledges, and how nothing depletes capital more than the sight of someone trying too hard. The fact that Tad spikes his hair into an archetypal punk mohawk is evidently not enough of a marker of authenticity for Reese, whose more restrained style is not as overtly coded as punk or hardcore, 
perhaps confirming his substance over style approach to the subculture and befitting of the DIY punk sensibility the band identifies itself by. Tiger dismisses this harsh judgment and retorts, nah, he's true, before dropping the record stylus on what turns out to be the legendary LA punk band Fear, the diegetic opening refrain of lead singer Lee Ving permeating the ending of the scene as he rips into the track Legalized Drugs, which is a, a nice counterpoint to Straight Edge Kegger, which, which I'll be talking about later on. This notion of being true to a scene or subculture is something that is revisited throughout the film, relating to the punk credentials of the central protagonists and how these credentials are thrown into disarray when confronting a method, method sorry, method, method, sorry, methodically, I'll get there eventually, um, violent subcultural faction. For Thornton, subcultural capital is ultimately embodied in the form of being in the know. And in this instance, Tad is accordingly judged as both a poser and as someone that embodies an appropriate level of subcultural legitimacy. Although this idea of authenticity functions thematically, I would like to show a clip from the A24 featurette accompanying Green Room entitled Designing a Subculture. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to drop the clip into the chat and give you, I think it's only a couple of minutes long, just an opportunity to watch it. So um, as you could see in the in the kind of the featurette, it was coming soon. So this was kind of you know pre-production as things were, were going on before it had been released. So I think it's quite an interesting way to see how the film is constructed. Um, but similarly, just to kind of move on a little bit here, um, Heather Buckley, who was the producer of The Ranger, has also talked about the constructed nature of subcultural style on screen. Rhetoric that also questions notions of authenticity and points towards significant contradictions. So for Buckley, the actual 80s punk rockers in suburbia, again, the Penelope Spheres film seems to be kind of a, a touch point here, are not that cinematic looking. There's a media punk aesthetic that became associated with films like Return of the Living Dead. At some point, because of the absurdity of the late 80s and early 90s, Punk rockers loved to see themselves in the movies, so they adopted the media punk style. In New York City, we all wore black, we wore studs, we all look like menaces to society. When you look at exploitation films, each punk rocker has a different outfit. Everyone has their particular iconic look that harkens back to a different kind of punk. In real life, all my friends look the same. We all wear black, we all have discharge t-shirts, it was finding the nuance of being iconic, but having some sort of authentic feel of the iconic look. Buckley's comments are interesting here, as there seems to be a suggestion that the iconic look referenced in The Ranger is anything but authentic and is representative of a different kind of punk. And this is true of the varied representations of the punk across other films like Green Room, Straight Edge Kegger, ranging from hardcore punk and straight edge, to the queer punk representations apparent in a film like Uncle Peckerhead, which I mentioned earlier. Again, like my pre previous exploration of Green Room suggests, elements of horror become more apparent when notions of subcultural capital and authenticity are challenged and perhaps even threatened. So not dissimilar to my work entitled The Kids Are Alt Rights, Hardcore Punk, Subcultural Violence and Contemporary American Politics in Jeremy Saulnier's Green Room, um, in which Johnny mentioned is, is my most recent publication, my book chapter, um, which came out earlier um, this year. The main title of this talk um, is, of course, another extraction from a notable punk tract. So this is not just a minor threat, obviously the band Minor Threat being referenced quite explicitly there. See, this is what happens when I go off piste. I lose my, I lose my, I lose my place. But anyway, so to this end, I would like to offer an alternative subtitle to this section of the talk that will hopefully become my next research article. So this is not just a minor threat: straight edge kegger, subcultural divisions, and disenfranchisement in contemporary punk horror. So in his work, Straight Edge, Clean Living, Youth, Hardcore Punk, and Social Change from 2007. Ross Hainfler offers a brief history of the straight edge subculture as it originated within the context of early 1980s North American hardcore punk. Acting as a point of origin, it was the frantic 44 second burst from the band Minor Threat that offered the initial manifesto that sparked the straight edge movement. 
Released in 1981, the fourth track from the self-titled Minor Threat EP, Straight Edge, promoted a drink and drug free lifestyle with the song lyrics reflecting the personal politics of frontman Ian McCart. And I was going to play a clip of this, but I thought it might be too intense. Um, so I'm going to read the lyrics. Um, it, it's obviously not as urgent as what it would be otherwise. So the lyrics go, I'm a person just like you, but I've got better things to do than sit around and fuck my head, hang out with the living dead, snort white shit up my nose, pass out at the shows. I don't even think about speed. That's something I just don't need. I've got the straight edge. I'm a person just like you, but I've got better things to do than sit around and smoke dope because I know that I can cope. I laugh at the thought of eating lewds, laugh at the thought of sniffing glue, always going to keep in touch, never want to use a crutch. I've got the straight edge. So the tenets of straight edge were further consolidated following the release of the band's second EP, In My Eyes. The track out of step, beginning with the short, sharp statements of I don't smoke, I don't drink, I don't fuck, at least I can fucking think. This additional statement was squarely aimed at the perceptions of conquest-driven sexual behaviour pervading the scene, actions that were deemed detrimental to what the scene was otherwise trying to achieve. As Hanfler suggests, the movement arose primarily as a response to the self-destructive, live-fast-die-young attitudes where, whereby a relatively conservative lifestyle combined with progressive punk ideals and harsh music sharply contrasted the conventional image of youth gone wild. Indeed, some of the more prevailing visible images of the punk subculture at the time had been those of the Sex Pistols of Sid Vicious, dying of apparent overdose in 1979, following his release on bail for the suspected murder of partner Nancy Spungen, and Elliot Punk Darby Crash of the Germs, who committed suicide by way of an intentional heroin overdose. So for Hanfler, early straight-edge youth viewed punk self-indulgent rebellion as no rebellion at all, suggesting that in many ways, punks reinforced mainstream culture's intoxicated lifestyle. So I'd just like to show the second and final clip um, of my talk. Um, again, if you just bear with me here, I'm just going to minimise this and get my link. So this is the trailer for the movie Straight Edge Kegger, which is what you can see on the screen at the moment. So again, I'm just going to drop this into the chat. If you just bear with me two seconds. OK, so that's the kind of the trailer. Um, there's a lot of the kind of the plot, I think, um, dissected there. So you can kind of get a good sense of what the film is um, from that two minutes. OK, so the narrative of Jason Zink's um, Straight Edge Kegger, if I'm just going to move on slightly here in my slides, um, emulates the principles of the straight edge movement and the way it has been represented in the wider American media. Moving from an initial set of ideals aimed at promoting sobriety and focus to increased levels of violence and pack mentality in the scene. The film opens with the proclamation, this film must be played loud, followed by title cards quoting the source of the straight edge movement, Ian McCart. And he quotes, I think the idea of straight edge, the song that I wrote and the way people have related it, there's some people who have abused it. They've allowed their fundamentalism to interfere with the real message which in my mind was that people should be allowed to live their lives the way they want to. The film centers on the strained relationship between several protagonists, Brad and James, and the rest of their crew coded as straight edge. James is a militant hardline advocate of the straight edge lifestyle and values, whereas Brad is depicted as a young man doubting the restrictions and violence such values seem to foster. In the earlier stages of the film, Brad is visibly disillusioned with the local punk scene he has been instrumental in creating, disturbed by the escalating violence and threatening behaviours of his crew, instigated by James as their leader. In an earlier sequence from the film, outlined in the film's trailer, James informs the frontman of the band Ugly Bones not to play their song Booze Hound, threatening the singer with the line, if you play that song, I'll fucking kill you. The aggression here is presumably because the song celebrates the antithesis of straight edge core values, something that James holds dear and is violently protective over. But of course, in true punk fashion, the band rip into this song as the frontman proclaims to the audience, the next one goes out to someone special, you know who you are, blowing a kiss and a knowing wink. Brad witnesses this interaction um, and the violence that follows with concern and apprehension. James climbing onto the stage before punching the singer from Ugly Bones to the ground. 
With this, the title card of the film flashes onto the screen, setting the tone for the conflict that is to follow. So on the face of it, the film plays out like a home invasion style slasher film with a group of masked antagonists descending onto a party full of young revelers in various stages of intoxication. However, given the fractured nature of the straight edge subculture, it is interesting to see how the values of straight edge and their inherent tensions as they evolved over time are encapsulated in this punk horror film. The militancy and violence observed here reflects this transition of straight edges values and politics as it has evolved between the 1980s and 1990s. Following the youth crew straight edge scene characterized by bands such as Gorilla Biscuits and Youth of Today, the late 1980s were also characterized by a more extreme radical form of straight edge rhetoric. The incarnation of straight edge in this instance, associated in large part with the self-identified vegan straight edge band Earth Crises, came to prominence in the early 1990s, specifically in the period between 1991 and 1993, and was initiated by the founding of the label Victory Records in 1989. And I am where I said Earth Crises, Earth Crisis. I do apologize to any hardcore stalwarts in the audience this evening. So bands like Earth Crisis from New York and Strife from California became defining bands of the new school era of straight edge hardcore. In terms of this historical development, the emergence of vegan straight edge in Syracuse, New York, alongside apparent moral panics involving hate edge street gangs and associations between straight edge and eco-terrorism, this went on to consolidate this often violent image of the subculture. It is this apparent splintering from the first wave of straight edge bands and figureheads into both the old school and the new school iterations of the subculture that have caused significant tensions in the wider cultural framings of straight edge and therefore illustrates problematic tensions in the construction and performance of subcultural identity more broadly. As Gabrielle Kuhn has argued in her collection of perspectives ranging across the different manifestations of straight edge culture, while the early Washington DC hardcore punk underground is usually praised for its commitment to positive social change, both the youth crew movement of the 1980s and the vegan straight edge movement of the 1990s have drawn much criticism. While the critique of the former largely focused on male bonding, things like the Brotherhoods and the Wolf Pack, martial posturing, slogans like true till death and nail to the X, and the lack of political perspective beyond vague affirmations of youth and unity, the latter was criticized for self-righteous militancy, a reductionist focus on animal rights and environmental issues, and an ethical fundamentalism that in its worst forms resembled reactionary Christian doctrines, condemnation of premarital sex, abortion, and homosexuality. A focus on extreme masculinities within the straight edge subculture again leads to further tensions and problems within the scene, principally addressing the way hegemonic masculinity is either affirmed, resisted, or renegotiated, but also how the role of women in straight edge culture is problematic, given the connotations of a brotherhood or a wolf pack. It is perhaps no coincidence that straight edge kegger presents its killers as conforming to these hypermasculine, extremely violent tendencies. One of the central antagonists wearing a sweatshirt emblazoned with the slogan, drug free youth, as he commits violent murder. The inciting incident in the film is when a disenfranchised Brad meets the figure of Sean, a beer drinking, pot smoking punk that appreciates straight edge hardcore, but does not subscribe to the philosophy. Sean, in an act that would have offended me, myself, deeply as someone that claims straight edge, albeit not necessarily without issue, he decides to spike Brad's drink with alcohol, effectively enable, enabling Brad to break edge, an almost sacrilegious act for those with a hardline perspective. As Brad begins to question the value of his previous sobriety, we follow these characters to the titular kegger party where the horrors of the film begin. At the party, Brad engages in a telling exchange with a young girl called Maybe, who asks Brad whether he is one of those truth or death dicks and what made him break edge. Brad enters into a sustained moment of contemplation, thinking about the previous actions of his former friend James and what straight edge meant to him initially and what it then became. Again, the script reflects the principal tenets of straight edge and inherent tensions within the subculture. As Brad states in response to maybe, it just got old, I guess. It turned into something I didn't really want it to be. When James and I started in on this whole straight edge thing, it was just as a means to get rid of all the bad shit it shows. Skinheads, drug dealers, 
a bunch of guys that were coming to our shows were affiliated in one way or another. When we started, it was just about making sure kids had a safe space, no fascists, no drugs, and it wasn't an SDD fest like with the hippies. So we get a little bit of stereotypical condemnation of the hippie subculture in the 1960s as well, which obviously isn't without problem here. So as time went on, James got more militants, the list of rules grew, and he cut ties with a lot of our old friends who he thought weren't true believers. Edge till death types. Now it just feels like an exclusive cub, club, club, club for bullies. The shows are just as unsafe and violent for the younger kids growing up in the scene. The remainder of the film plays out like the violently, like, like a violent actuality of the Project X song Straight Edge Revenge. The perceived betrayal by Brad to his crew and to James specifically resulting in violent murder. And the Project X song lyric is um, this time you push me too far. So, you know, James is embodying that kind of militant rhetoric here. So when Brad asks James in the violent quarter of the film, what was the point in all of this? James replies, if you don't know, well, you never got it. Again, questioning authenticity, devotion, and an assumed truth death belief. So I would just also like to note that um, it should, you know, it should be apparent that director Jason Zink um, is not without humour when constructing this anti-edge film. So as social media posts and promotional material would suggest, um, Zinc is positioned within the scene to deconstruct its core values and tenets. And doing a little bit of wider research around this in, in preparation for this talk, many months ago, um, I found this kind of straight edge kegger drinking game to be quite hilarious. And I thought this was quite amusing. So yeah, I thought I would include it. So as a point of conclusion, um, this talk, has aimed to explore the ways in which examples of punk horror can observe and incorporate the changing subcultural values, sensibilities, and politics of punk into their narratives and wider production contexts. Although drawn from a tentative canon of more recent films, this discussion is part of a wider project aiming to chart the cultural history of punk exploitation cinema, of which punk horror is one small part. It perhaps also makes sense to pick up on certain threads this talk has been unable to contain. So with the publication of Queer Core, How to Punk a Revolution earlier this year, recent criticism around the subculture or the most recent criticism around the subculture has turned towards the representation of queer identities in punk subcultures. A point I was not able to fully develop here in relation to a film like Uncle Peckerhead, although I have mentioned it. This publication in particular points towards a queer core and queer core influential, influen influential filmography, listing films such as The Decline of Western Civilization, Penelope Spheris again, but other examples of punk horror such as Elliot Zombie by Bruce LaBruce from 2010. As this talk has touched upon subcultural notions of authenticity, the performance of that authenticity and the violence inherent to certain areas of punk subcultures, it is perhaps in relation to these shifting areas of identity politics that this research could be taking further. And I know that sounds overly formal, but because it's my first keynote, I wanted to end with some further acknowledgements of work yet to be done. Um, I think I'm on time 10 to 8, marvellous. I was very worried that wasn't going to be timed correctly, but that is my talk finished. I really appreciate listening, your listening, um, and I guess we're over to questions and discussion points now. Okay. Thank you, Tom. Can you can you hear me? Sorry, I'm just I'm just um stop sharing my slides. So it's no, that's clear. fine. Yeah, sorry. Uh, yes, I can hear you. Okay, yeah. Good, excellent, great. Because I was having some technical uh, difficulties technical earlier. Technical difficulties. The technical. <laughs> um, that was great. Thank you so much, Tom. Uh, I really appreciate it. I got a lot out of it. Um, the the questions are are pouring. They're pouring in. Oh wow. <laughs> um, and I was going to ask one, but I'm going to I'm going to bank it. Um, so we've got one from, I'm going to ask Craig's next, um, second, because it's his party. <laughs> um, so I'm going to, I'll, I'll ask uh, Kev's first. So we've got one from Kev Bickerdike. And he says, given the mutual respect and connections between punk and thrash metal, not, not least of which Sphere is moving from punk to thrash documentary, have you identified similar problems with potential misrepresentations of metal within film, Tom? 
was and is metal a trope that's lazily portrayed? That's a good um, question. I think, yeah, so so I really appreciate that. The, oh, I'm on, am I on mute? Can you hear me okay? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, sorry, sorry. Um, cheers for the, the, the question, Kev. It's always nice to know that you're in the audience. Um, I think with metal, uh, I think initially when I was going to deliver this keynote, it was about music subcultures more broadly. Um, so I'm kind of glad I just um, focused on punk specifically because I think we'd be here all night otherwise. So I think there's definitely this kind of crossover between notable examples um, in horror cinema, which, which do kind of touch upon uh, metal um, subcultures. And my own work um, in that area um, tends to be, you know, the stuff around uh, Norwegian black metal um, and the kind of mythologies um, and kind of misrepresentations of those particular narratives. So kind of touching upon the more extreme side of things there. So I do think um, if we're talking about exploitation cinema and kind of horror as, a, as an offshoot of that, it's always really interesting to see what members or kind of people who identify with these su specific subcultural scenes, how they um, talk about these particular films. So in the research around punk, reading the zines and kind of reviews from people who you would argue might be more receptive to these films, they are quite negative. They are quite derogatory about how they are seeing themselves represented on screen. Um, so I guess what I'm trying to say is I've dabbled in a little bit of the, the, the research around metal, specifically black metal with things like Lords of Chaos, um, obviously around Mayhem and Burzum and things like that. Obviously we've had a discussion about that. Um, but I think in terms of a wider project around music and horror, um, it's definitely something that, that I would need to look into more because I know there's a, there's a whole canon of, of films that deal with metal and various kind of subcultures within that as well. So yeah, so definitely something uh, food for thought there, I think. Awesome, right? Okay, Tom, we've got. Uh, I'll ask. Devil Craig horns, now. someone's saying. <laughs> yeah, that's that's right. I, I can't do that at the minute because I've got trigger finger. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> anyway, enough about me. Uh, Craig asks this question. He says, and he's happy for me to ask it. Okay. So he bloody should be. <laughs> I'm wondering to what extent you would say there's a pervasive anti-fascist feeling in contemporary punk horror films. It's clear in Green Room, but it seems like we could also pick that out of the Ranger 2 on a more subtextual level and maybe Straight Edge Kegger, though Craig hasn't seen it. So to what extent would you say there's a pervasive anti-fascist feeling in contemporary punk horror films? I think it kind of goes hand in hand with um, broader ideologies of, of punk, if we kind of take punk as a broader kind of umbrella term. And obviously I know there's there's different kind of um, splinters within that, different kind of subcultural scenes and, and people who respond differently to that. But one of the things that I was picking up, and this is across a range of, of different examples of punk exploitation and also some of the examples that I mentioned, is this kind of really um, anti-authoritarian stance which, which we get. And, you know, this kind of, you know, there's the psychotic lawmen um, and psychotic kind of law enforcement in, in a lot of these films. Um, and I guess that there's a, there's a kind of anti-fascist anti sentiment, which is perhaps the more extreme end of, of those kind of representations, I think. And I think it's more obvious in something like Green Room, where we have um, the faction of violent racist skinheads, but the idea with that is that that ideology kind of falls away when there's a very basic threat to their way of life. So within Green Room, it, it's revealed that they are actually drug runners and they are um, kind of, you know, they, they are involved with, with, with non-white drug dealers, which, which is kind of something which the film points at. So it's kind of, well, how far is that, is that record kind of espoused within those movies and, and how easily does it kind of fall away? Um, so I think it is there. Um, and there is a kind of lineage from those punk exploitation movies of, of the 80s um, in, in that sense as well, I think. So, yeah, so again, it's kind of a rumination. It's not necessarily a, a definitive answer there, but, but I do think there's kind of an underlying tension there, definitely. Thanks, Tom. Right, so we've got one from uh, Laura Me, um, and she's asking it on behalf of her husband, Ben. Oh, okay. Uh, and Ben says, um, are there any further examples of sincere or insincere, read authenticity, punk depictions and other contemporary horror texts that aren't films explicitly about the scene? 
Okay, so that, that's a really interesting question. And I mean, that might be, um, I'm going to admit, perhaps a, a little bit of a blind spot there, um, because I think I've been that focused on, on researching these films, which are kind of, you know, they're about the, the kind of politics um, and kind of fractured politics within the scene. I think when we kind of look at something like, I don't know, there's, there's kind of other examples that kind of do touch upon that. So one of the more recent examples would be um, Adam Remire, um, who directed The Bunny Game, which is this kind of really graphic, hardcore horror film, um, which, which kind of figures really, really significantly into my previous research. And he's going to turn a bit of a bit of a corner, shall we say, with his most recent release, uh, Dinner in America, which is, by all accounts, I would consider it to be to be a punk exploitation movie. Um, but it's kind of like I don't know if it's, it's it's not like a romantic comedy, but it definitely does different things with the relationship and the kind of punk subculture within that. So that might be another example of of, of this type of text, maybe. Yeah. But but otherwise, I think you know I'll have to you know broaden broaden my scope i think okay so we've got one from shelly and i should just say before i ask this question actually that um we are nearing eight o'clock but we've got we have permission to go over um by a few minutes so um if anybody has another any other questions we'll, we'll try and get through them so shelly um says she's happy for me to ask it again because she's sick Get well soon, Shelley. No one's come on on microphone this evening. It's like it's like students all over again. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm here, mate. <laughs> so Shelley's saying, I wondered if Tom could talk a bit more about the position of women in straight edge culture. Are they thought of as helpless or to be protected? Are they thought of as irrelevant or held to the same standards? And she says, I was thinking about how they are characterized in straight edge kegger more than anything. Is kind of expendable. Okay, so so yeah, I mean that's a really interesting point. So I mean, historically speaking, reading around the kind of the history, the histories of hardcore, shall we say, which you know have been written by and large um, by white men, um, and there's significant problems within those particular texts as well, and, and kind of how they talk about films um, as a kind of representation of that. So. One of the things, uh, or one of the texts that I was was really kind of um, into, shall we say, as a as a as an early punk trying to find his way within these kind of subcultures, was um, the American Hardcore book by Stephen Blush. Now, that particular book is is very problematic because he is he is well quite quite an outright misogynist, shall we say, in how he's characterising um, women um, within the scene as nothing more than people who would you know hold my drink or he's my coat why the, the boyfriends or, or their male friends would go and get involved um, sort of slam dancing or, or doing whatever to black flag and, and, and minor threat and the bad brains and things like that. In, in recent years, um, and I think this is a kind of maybe a result of a lot of alternative histories being written around things like Riot Girl and also kind of um, maybe more marginalised voices within punk and hardcore in the various scenes. Um, we get these kind of other other voices emerging. So one of the books that has been recently released um, is by an author called Nancy Burreal, who is the wife of Al Burreal, who was the guitarist for prominent Boston straight edge band um, SSD, or um, Society System D Control. And what her work is doing, and, and it's kind of being celebrated, is kind of disrupting what those um, accepted histories of hardcore and punk um, are or have been established um, emerging in the 1980s into the 1990s. Um, and I think within certain examples of, of, of cinema, um, there are kind of more, um, I don't know, progressive depictions of, of women um, or kind of, you know, of, of non-male kind of identifying um, protagonists within these particular movies. So Ungol Peckerhead, um, the, the zombie guy that I was saying I resembled when I had norovirus, for example. Um, the, the fictional band in that particular movie um, is a, is a three-piece. So we have um, a, a gay identifying male and, 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 two, and two women who are kind of, um, you know, they're struggling within the DIY scene. But again, it's kind of taking ownership of that culture and their position within that. So the expendability in these other films these kind of more violent examples are perhaps offset by these lighter, more 
um, comedic horror films, I think, which which I kind of en- en- encompass within this punk horror um, subgenre, shall we say. So again, it's not it's not an answer, um, but again, a rumination on that. There's definitely some kind of movement moves being made um, to maybe move away from those stereotypes positions of women within the scene. So hope, hopefully that that is some kind of response to that. Yeah. Shelley's got a follow up question. Okay. <laughs> and she says, Tom, what's your desert island punk band? See, that is the question. These are the questions. Ah, uh, right. I'm gonna say because a lot riding of the, on this. because of their varied output, which has influenced so many bands that I really like, whether they're kind of progressive or really heavy. Um, there's two answers that I wanted to give, um, <laughs> but I think I'm only allowed one because it's obviously Desert Island. So I'm gonna go on with me first love which is these guys have got the bars emblazoned there, black flag for anyone not in the know. I've got a range of other examples here. So Converge would be my other cheat, cheat band there. But yeah, so so yeah, <laughs> there we go. Fabulous answers, <laughs> Thomas. Thank you. Um, right, okay, I think this will be the last question. All right. Um, Laura, I'm wondering... And she's happy for me to ask. I don't know why I read that out. I'm sorry. I'm wondering how these films have been received within the scene more broadly and how much the subcultural status slash punk histories of... Right, I'm so sorry. I'm going to start this question again, if you don't mind. I'm wondering it's, how these it's films... Probably, have been it's re- probably for the best. Yeah, thank you. Sorry. I'm wondering how these films have been received within the scene more broadly and how much the subcultural status or the punk histories of certain filmmakers influence that well i'm gonna ask you to repeat it i'm sorry mate i'm so sorry okay <laughs> I, do not blame me this I'm is so laura sorry. May's fault. i'm so sorry yeah laura's having a great time though <laughs> to be fair um it's the syntax of the sentence <laughs> i'm wondering how these films have been received within the scene more broadly right part okay. one okay okay and how much the subcultural status of certain filmmakers have influenced the reception of these okay. films Right, I get you. So it's really interesting to see this kind of idea of subcultural reception. So I kind of went down a little bit of a rabbit hole um, with reading a lot of zines, so things like Maximum Rock and Roll um, and kind of touch and go and all of these different kinds of things. And that was kind of trying to get a sense of how punk exploitation films in the 1980s were being received. So things like Class of 1984, but also the work of Penelope Spheris. So I think within the kind of, you know, this, this kind of idea of subcultural influence, you kind of get you kind of get one of two things going on. So a lot of the older punk exploitation films are really derided. And I was quite surprised by that. They are seen as damaging and derogatory and perhaps like, there's, there's kind of this, this sense that, well, the, these are being made by people um, because of the moral panics surrounding punk as it's emerging, the kind of fears or more broader kind of societal concerns around this. Um, and that, that kind of taps into kind of, you know, histories of youth exploitation more broadly from the 60s and the 70s and things like this, um, and how those films in the 80s are kind of being received in that milieu, you know, which is quite a conservative reaction to these films, I think, by people from within the scene. But then you get, you know, as, as the paper might have suggested, there's constant reference to filmmakers like Penelope Spheris, who was a writer, um, a kind of a, a zine writer herself, but then went on to, you know, the documentary, The Decline of Western Civilization, was documenting LA hardcore, black flag, circle jerks, fear. And then she goes on to make the, the feature movie Suburbia, um, which I think has just came out, a really nice Blu-ray release. So those are the kind of, I guess, the, the the touch points and you get this kind of reference you know when you've got um the producer from the ranger saying well we're, we're trying to look at what penelope spherus was doing with suburbia we're trying to emulate that or trying to move away from that and there's also a sense that these these newer films these kind of new punk horror movies are being quite gladly received within the scene but that is because they are arguably being made by filmmakers, screenwriters, even musicians who are still active within those particular scenes as well. So this is where we kind of get the the subcultural capital and authenticity arguments 
um, going on there. And I, th I think that's a really interesting dichotomy or maybe kind of um, transition to, to observe, I think. And I'm, again, it's because it's eight. Yeah, I know you've just said in the chat it's eight a.m. eight p.m. on a Friday, giving you a break. So hopefully these these responses make sense um, by the same token. There, <laughs> Tom. There's there's one more question that I'd like to ask, if that's okay. Yeah, go for it. Um, obviously, you know, you know, I'm interested in sort of in industry chiefly, uh, and I guess that I'm just I'm wondering. I mean. I guess Laura's alluded to it in a, in a question when she's talking about how the how the films have been received within the the punk scenes scenes, um. But like, what's the commercial imperative like behind making films about punk today? Because it's not as if like the 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 type of punk that Straight Edge Kegger is interested in is like you know pervasive across the, the mainstream. Yeah. It's not, I wouldn't go so far to say it's like hipsterish or anything per se. Um, so, I mean, why, why are these films, why are these films being, being made? I mean, th this is the killer question that I don't think I have a ready response for. I think the kind of films that I'm looking at, obviously from this kind of more, um, I don't know you call it, an, an independence sort of background so they do tend to be the kind of the early films of, of these particular filmmakers as well obviously Jeremy Saulnier Green Room was kind of his sophomore effort I guess after after Blue Ruin and um, we have things like Uncle Peckerhead's uh, Straight Edge Kegger which, which was crowdfunded as well so All right, it's okay. really kind of interesting um kind of you know I, I didn't have time to show them but I had initially planned to maybe show that the kind of the um the the the, the, the kickstarter video to encourage kind of participation with that. And I think that was a film, that was a project that I supported as well. So I think some, I mean, again, I'm probably not answering the question here, but I do think in, in, a, in, a, in a lot of cases, these films are, are made by either fans of the subgenres or subcultures um, for those particular um, people within those scenes. Um, but, you know, things like Straight Edge Kegger is, is, is fairly recently been released on Shudder. Which, which was which was quite interesting, I thought, um, especially for, you know, people might not necessarily be aware of what Straight Edge is or kind of why it makes an interesting kind of slasher movie. And this, this was another thing what I was kind of thinking about is this kind of how we have these conservative um, killers who are going after um, drunken teenagers, which perhaps isn't that dissimilar to very maybe reductive tropes of, of slasher cinema. So I think maybe trying to, look into the industrial context a little bit more um, it's, it's something that I'd have to do because I do think that's that's maybe a piece of the puzzle that that I am missing um, but you know we, we can have that discussion I think out, out outside of this mess by well, all means uh, thank, thanks for you know thanks thanks for responding to the question because it's it's, it's fascinating and I suppose what what your paper has shown um, is really just how broad church, the horror genre is today right i mean it, it always was but you know if there's room for horror films about really niche subcultures like you know i guess that's i don't know it tests like the dynamism and the health of the genre right in the in the 21st century i mean i, mean, I think it's quite interesting because I, I was i was getting quite not self-conscious but but I, I kind of went off on one talking about straight edge kegger i think um which which is what i wanted to write about for, for a long while and I was kind of thinking about, well, is this because, you know, you, you do have this, this perhaps more militant, violent conception of what this subculture is? And I know that Jeremy Solnier is obviously talking about that in Green Room when he's framing this kind of, you know, this scene as being invaded or at least kind of, you know, there's, there's parts of it which are fascist or kind of, you know, the neo-Nazi kind of skinheads kind of perspectives as well, which obviously has that historical kind of lineage. But then you get something like Uncle Peckerhead, which which is totally different. It's kind of this uh, this really sort of bizarre, like demonic horror comedy, which just happens to be kind of talking about poses and authenticity and queer identities within within hardcore. So there's some really interesting things going on. Um, whether it's a it's a kind of a, a cycle of movies, maybe we could we consider it as that, perhaps. Because I mean, it's roughly a five-year period where where you know these case studies seem to be be lying, um, and it's obviously something I'm I'm keeping an eye out for because I'm just really interested in, in kind of 
looking and examining these particular movies. Um, so yeah, I'm going to stop rambling. I feel like I'm rambling now. I do apologise well, for that, everyone. Well, thank well, you thank for you listening very, very... to me and indulging me, everyone. No, well, thanks so much, Tom. It was a, it was a, it was a great talk. We have to draw things to a close there. Uh, thanks again, Tom. Thanks to everybody who who asked a question. Thank you, um, everyone. And we will see you next time. Bye. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>